there are bonds that kill and bonds that save. Do those that interlace the bodies of the deceased Lord and of the pensive witnesses lead to disaster or to salvation? Here we witness Jesus born to his burial place, escorted by his friends. Rather than appearing sad, they tread lightly, as if dancing around Christ. It is as if the tomb, perhaps that cavity in the upper right-hand corner, towards which they accompany Jesus, had the attraction of a nuptial chamber, where some intimate ceremony will take place, in the silence and the shadows, the resurrection that was cried out for by their souls and promised by his word. For the present, however, the body of Christ resembles a corpse, which, judging from the arms of his friends, is hardly light. He is supported by long strips of cloth, the same ones, most likely, that Joseph of Arimathea, the bearded figure behind Christ, St John the Evangelist, in red to the left, and Nicodemus, in green to the right, used to thread around the sacred limbs when they brought Christ down from the cross. Filled with saintly respect, the disciples carry the body of he who raised others from the dead in this improvised stretcher. Note that their hands do not actually touch their gentle burden. They simply support him on the cloth. Moreover, the body, though lifeless, seems to move under its own volition and to walk alone, as is suggested by the undulation which inclines Christ's face to the right and his legs to the left. Jesus does not have the stiffness of a cadaver, less still the appearance of a victim of torture. There is indeed no trace on Christ's sides, revealed for our devotion by the artist, of the countless scars of the flagellation or of the blows of his executioners. And on this smooth, rounded forehead, where are the cuts inflicted by the crown of thorns, or the traces on the hands and ribs of such recent suffering. If Michelangelo omitted to paint the stigmata, it's not that he was unaware of their eternal existence as glorious signs of Christ's passion, but that most likely he did not have the time to add such crucial details to this unfinished work. In fact, the only visible scar is the navel, located an equal distance from the eyes of John and Nicodemus, which marks a seal of love on the immaculate flesh. With this gentle wound, the new Adam bears witness to his origins. It is from a woman drawn from among us by the Holy Spirit that God the Son received the human form needed for our redemption. The cord, now gone, left on Christ's stomach a mark that neither the flails of the whips nor the nails of the gibbet could overshadow. The link of love of which the dead Christ's umbilical mark reminds us points always towards the mother who bore in her holy womb the author of all life. The same incompleteness of the picture allows us to suppose that the artist was reserving for Mary, under the bust of the saintly woman on the right, the lower unpainted right-hand corner of the panel. Unfortunately, only a vague contour suggests the kneeling silhouette of the Virgin. The posture of St Mary Magdalene on the left, possibly the earring denotes her, informs us of that which was intended for the Mother of the Saviour. Lastly, the disciples occupy a symmetrical position on both sides of Christ. These Christ's porters are true Christophers, literally carriers of Christ. The colours of their clothing are carefully coordinated. St John is wrapped in a red tunic with green highlights, while Nicodemus wears a green tunic on top of a red shirt. The ties with which they support Christ 
complete the unity of the central trio. This is not only because of the intrinsic cohesion conferred on the group by the intertwining of the bands around the three figures, above all, it is because of the reference made by this very particular composition to a no less prestigious but much earlier work of art, the discovery of which so struck Michelangelo that it remained with him throughout his life. This other masterpiece, however, is not a painting, but a statue, the Laocoon. Unearthed in Rome in 1506, this group composition came from Rhodes, where it had been sculpted seventeen centuries earlier by three artists. It shows the high priest Lao Kun with his two sons, suffocated by two serpents. The entombment replicates the structure of this group, replacing Lao Kun with Christ, the two boys with St. John and Nicodemus, and finally the reptiles with bands of white cloth. These coil from John's stomach, right shoulder and hips, under Christ's arms and over his torso, to writhe themselves around Nicodemus's waist and behind his back to his right shoulder, before passing down his left hand back to John under the legs of Jesus and over those of John before finally dropping down at the latter's right foot, forming as they go the most serpentine of shapes. Before highlighting the surprising avenues that the references to the Laocoon open up for a spiritual analysis of the entombment, we should note the objective similarities between the two works. Christ, naked like Laocoon, is at the centre of the group. Both figures twist to the left. His left forearm is hidden by that of Nicodemus, like Laocoon's is by the serpent. His right arm is invisible, just as Laocoon's was missing before the statue was restored. The thighs of both main figures are offset to the right against their upright bodies. Their right legs are more bent than their left, and their heads lean against their left shoulder. However, Christ's feet, which are held together, resemble those of the sun on the left. The difference in height marking the first step which separates St. John's feet, is the same as that of the base of the pedestal on which the high priest is seated in the Laocoon. St. John's legs, the anatomy of which is revealed completely even under his tunic, look like a painted copy of Laocoon's. Above the right thigh, the transverse formed by the band across St. John's imitates the serpent across Laocoon's. Similarly, St. John's right hand grips the cloth in the same fashion as Lao Kun seizes the serpent with his left fist. Of the sun on the right, as with Nicodemus to the right of the Lord, only one foot is visible. Both figures are seen from the left profile. Finally, the full beard and the knitted brow of Lao Kun, while absent on Christ's face, are faithfully reproduced just above in the features of Joseph of Arimathea, the third disciple in the centre, whose face is closest to that of Jesus. From the spiritual angle that concerns us, let us first only take stock of the formal similarities between the two works, which make the Laocoon appear as the pagan negative 
or reverse of the entombment. Thus these bonds of love, the white cloth, which unite the three central figures, become pregnant with unsuspected meaning as soon as they are seen as the poetic transposition of the serpents of hate, which in the group from antiquity suffocate both father and sons. Once the link between these bonds of death and these ropes of life has been identified, the various fictions of the legend of Laokun unfold before our eyes as judicious counterpoints that throw into sharp relief the historical truth of Christ's passion. Thus Laokun, son of the Trojan monarch Priam, is the sacrificer of a pagan divinity. Jesus, son of King David, is that of the eternal priesthood announced by Melchizedek. Both warn their fellow men against a mortal danger. In both cases, the populace accuse them of betraying the very God they claim to serve. Laokun is denounced for sacrilege, Christ for being an impostor. In both cases, the object of their doom is a wooden assemblage improvised by the enemy and drawn up in front of the city. In one case, the Greek horse on the fringes of Troy, in the other the cross of the Romans on the edge of Jerusalem, to the left of St. John's head. Laocoon throws his spear against the wooden horse. Jesus is speared by a lance on the Calvary cross, surrounded by the two crucified thieves. Both groups of men are forced by their enemies to languish on the arms of the cross and inside the horse until the hour of darkness. Both objects, which the population hoped would win them political security, end up as agents of siege. The Trojans believed the lie of the renegade Sinon, who promised them the protection of Athena if they admitted into their walls the wooden horse that had been offered to her. Trusting in the traitor Judas, the high priest Caiaphas abducted Christ from the Mount of Olives and imprisoned him in the city where he condemned him, calculating that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Yet the contempt that the two peoples had for their respective priests, whether Laokun or Jesus, led on the western fringes of the same Asian continent to the respective ruins of Ilion and of Zion. Troy was in fact raised by the Greeks, Jerusalem by the Romans. In both cases, the Mediterranean victors came from the west, Lacedaemon, Sparta, and Latium, Italy. This sculpture from Greek antiquity and this painting from the Italian Renaissance thus set each other off, to the advantage of the latter and to the benefit of the viewer. Considered in itself, the fable of Laocoon is certainly evocative, but what an explosion in meaning is lent to it by the Christian revelation. Instead of a despairing meditation on the human condition, the Laocoon becomes instead the pagan herald of the unique sacrifice. The impotence of the mythical high priest highlights and reveals the total efficiency of the crucifixion, the ultimate act of the historical high priest and divine Christ. We can develop this parallel further. The Son of God has just died on the cross to save all mankind. Because his passion, which is completed in the arms of his disciples, is the redeeming sacrifice. The bonds of charity which join John and Nicodemus to the dead body of Christ are the bonds of life which lead them beyond the grave to salvation. By contrast, the bonds which attach the still living Laocoon to his children lead them to death. For as the monstrous serpents of the Laocoon form a poisonous web and force themselves on their unwilling victims, so the linens in the entombment are instruments of a delicate compassion for Christ and are thus willingly carried by the disciples. Snakes and strips thus symbolize a common idea, that of parentage. The reptiles suggest a material parentage, subject to space and time. 
The linen bands describe a spiritual parentage, which grace frees from earthly constraints. These alternatives force us to make a choice. Where do we see ourselves? Whose sons do we recognize in ourselves? Of which values, which history, which vision of the world, of which spirit do we claim to be the heirs? The first type of parentage is oppressive. It evokes the bad relationship we have with the laws of our human nature and the divine vocation which these laws remind us of. We are tied by deceit, by vice, by complicity and by crime to this impure object, whether it be visible or invisible, that is defined by our actions as the centre of our existence. This is symbolised in the Laocoon by the central figure of the father, from whom the sons are unable to separate themselves. Like meteorites approaching a black hole, they only gravitate towards him for their imminent demise. Ensnared by the coils of our sins, we die like these children of a constriction that is all the more efficient in that we think ourselves free. Only the second parentage is truly liberating. John and Nicodemus remain perfectly free to drop on the spot the coils of cloth that encircle their bodies. These bonds link them to the only living object, God, whose grace preserves from corruption the body soon to be glorified at Easter. No, nothing holds these bound men back, since as children of salvation, everything enraptures them. Due to Michelangelo's inspiration, the traditional sorrow of the entombment is in this instance infused with a peace which illuminates the faces, softens the poses, and fortifies the souls. Above all, from the smooth surface of the holy body in the centre, a glowing candour seems to flow from Christ's breast, through the pale strips held by the disciples down to the holy women. Whereas the serpents spewed venom into the sides of their victims, these streams of whiteness seem to well up from Christ, irrigating his bearers, surrounded by milky softness. He comes to wash away tears and to anoint those who love him. Oh,